So today's episode comes to you courtesy of Aaron, who's been supporting this channel as a general tier patron. I truly couldn't do this without the support from amazing patrons like Aaron, so again, Aaron, thank you so much. And for the personalized stack tech, Aaron actually chose an Omega level commander, one that is incredibly powerful and a massive threat. So the Omega level commander that was chosen is Orvar the All Four, with a deck concept called Copyright Infringement focused on copying your opponent's decks. Orvar is a 3-3 shapeshifter with changeling that costs 3 and a blue. It has, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, if it targets one or more other permanents you control, create a token that's a copy of one of those permanents. And when a spell or ability an opponent controls causes you to discard this card, create a token that's a copy of target permanent. Now that second part probably isn't going to be relevant, but it really doesn't need to be because that first part, okay, I mean the changeling's nice and we'll talk about some cards that benefit from that, the part where simply by targeting one of your permanents with an instant or sorcery, you can make a copy of it. So obviously you can build an entire deck around copying your own permanents that you know you own. The concept for this deck again kind of turns it on its head where we are going to gain control of our opponent's permanents and then make an absurd amount of copies of their most powerful things to take them out with their own cards. Yeah, Orvar can be built in a lot of powerful ways, and yeah, I really like this spicy concept. So we're going to be running some ways to steal our opponent's things. Now that might be either a permanent way to steal that thing, or it might be a temporary effect. But again, as long as we control it and we can create a copy of it, we will get to keep that copy. Which, of course, then we can copy again, and again, and again. We've got a lot of very effective ways at targeting permanence, and yeah, just an absurd amount of ways, really. Now, with the cards in this deck, actually outside of Orvar, which is around 3 or $4, every single other card is less than $1, so it's a very budget-friendly deck. And as I'm taking you through the cards on this episode, I'm going to be breaking things down in different tactics to show you how this deck works and how we're going to win with it. And one more thing, if you are interested in this deck, make sure you check out that deck list link in the description below. And now with all that said, let's jump into it. First up, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, which we of course can pay two to tap and sacrifice to get a basic land into play tapped. But of course, we're also going to be running some great mana rocks in this deck as well, like Arcane Signet, which can tap for, you know, blue. Right away, Felwar Stone, which usually can because it can tap at one mana of any color that a land and opponent controls could produce, and then Prismatic Lens, which can only tap for a colorless, but we can also pay one into it and tap it for a blue so we can filter mana with it. Moving on, we've got Liquid Metal Torque and Mind Stone, each of which have some utility. We can tap them for a colorless, or we can utilize the Liquid Metal Torque to turn a non-land permanent into an artifact until end of turn, and then Mind Stone can be sacrificed to draw a card. Next up, we've got two mana rocks then, the Battlefield, tap with Sky Diamond and Cold Steel Heart, each of which are going to tap for a blue. Or, okay, Cold Steel Heart, I should say, we can choose any color, but yeah, we're going to choose blue when it comes into play. And then Midnight Clock isn't quite as efficient. It does cost three mana overall, but it can tap for a blue, and we can pay two and a blue and put an hour counter on it. At the beginning of each upkeep, we also get an hour counter on it, and when it gets its 12th counter, we shuffle our hand and graveyard into a library and draw seven cards, and we exile Midnight Clock. So there's some great card advantage there. And speaking of card, okay. Okay, well, card selection more so. Jace Sanctum can help us out too. It says instant sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast, so that can save us a ton of mana throughout the game. And on top of that, whenever you cast an instant sorcery spell, scry one, which again is not card advantage, but is fantastic card selection. Moving on though, one spell that can actually be a massive ritual effect in a way is energy tap. Its oracle text reads, tap target untapped creature you control. If you do, add an amount of colorless equal to that creature's mana value. Again, with this deck, we are looking to take our opponent's permanence and then utilize them. So yeah, if we take an opponent's creature, again, either permanently or temporarily, we can utilize a spell like this to actually target it. We get a token copy of that. And of course, also, we can get a massive amount of mana with this if we're taking one of our opponent's big threats. But speaking of taking our opponent's things...
Now let's move on and talk about some ways to do just that with cards like Ray of Command and Overtaker. Ray of Command says, untap target creature and opponent controls and gain control of it until end of turn. That creature gains haste until end of turn. When you lose control of that creature, tap it. So again, we basically are borrowing one of our opponent's creatures. We're just temporarily threatening that creature. Again, the opponent is going to get control of it again at some point, uh, and that creature is going to be tapped, but still... While it's under our control, we can cast spells to target it to make token copies of it. So, of course, with something like this, well, we can help make a massive army of, you know, the most powerful creature on the board, or, yeah, really take advantage of ETBs or, you know, triggers, etc., etc. Next up, how about Overtaker, which is a great repeatable effect. For our three and a blue, we can tap to discard a card from our hand to untap to our creature and gain control of it until end of turn. That creature gains haste until end of turn. So, yeah, we can utilize that creature, we can swing with it, and, of course, this is a great repeatable repeatable way to just, you know, get our opponent's best creatures and make more copies of them with our other spells. But of course, like I mentioned, there are some more permanent ways to take advantage of our opponent's things, like, you know, with Master Thief, Mind Flayer, and Shield Broker. Master Thief has, when it enters the battlefield, gain control target artifact for as long as you control Master Thief. So just think of the potential of a play of even just stealing your opponent's soul ring. Making multiple copies of that can really get out of hand. Or how about Mind Flayer, when it enters the battlefield, gain control target creature for as long as you control Mind Flayer. So again, whether we have, you know, Master Thief or Mind Flayer in play, if we've already made copies of the thing that we stole, even if they get dealt with, we still keep those copies. Next up, Shield Broker is somewhat similar. When it enters the battlefield, put a shield counter on target non-commander creature you don't control. You gain control of that creature for as long as there's a shield counter on it. So again, a somewhat permanent, somewhat temporary effect, but again, one that we can take advantage of and make copies of that creature. Next up, some more permanent effects, though, come with some spells like Entrancing Melody, Lull Mage's Domination, and Mass Manipulation. Entrancing Melody says gain control target creature with converted mana cost X. Low Mage's Domination does cost an extra blue, but it's going to cost three less to gas if it targets a creature whose controller has eight or more cards in their graveyard. So essentially, we can get up to three mana for free with this spell and yeah, help us gain control of a creature. And then Mass Manipulation can help us gain control of even more than one creature, gain control of XR creatures and or Planeswalker. Moving on, how about Tempted by the Aurique? For each opponent, gain control of up to one target creature or Planeswalker that player controls with mana value three or less. So this can help us gain control of multiple things. Or how about Confiscation Coop, which is somewhat flexible choose target artifact or creature you get four energy counters then you may pay an amount of energy equal to act permanence converted mana cost if you do gain control of it or how about just straight up with invoke the winds gain control of target artifact or creature untap it each of these can be very effective in a lot of situations because like i mentioned once we gain control of our opponent's permanent we've got plenty of ways to copy them First up, how about some cards that could essentially target anything we're going to be stealing, like, you know, Dream Script or Giga Drowse or even Mind Games. Dream Script says choose one tap target permanent or untap target permanent and we can entwine it for one. So again, with this, we can choose to target literally anything we want to target, no matter if we steal an artifact or a creature, it doesn't matter, we can target it. Or if we have to, you know, target one of our lands in certain situations, and we'll talk about some of those great lands here in a bit. But yeah, next up, there's Giga Drowns, which we can replicate for a blue, and it says tap target permanent. Again, these low to the ground target spells can be key at copying something incredibly quickly. Moving on, how about Mind Games, which says tap target artifact creature or land. So again, the three main things we're going to want to be able to target. And of course, on top of that, we can buy it back for two and a blue. So essentially, this is a repeatable, you know, four mana way to target things. Next up, some cards that, well, kind of do nothing, but also do a lot for this deck. Let's talk about cards like Thought Lace, Moon Lace, and Mind Bend. Thought Lace's Oracle Text reads, target spell or permanent becomes blue. Now, do we really care if we can actually make something blue? Um, probably not. What we really care about is just being able to target something for a single mana. And again, we can target whatever we want with this. In a somewhat similar way, there's Moonlace, which says target spell or permanent becomes colorless. And then Mind Ben says change the text of target permanent by replacing all instances of one color word with another or one basic land type with another. And it really doesn't matter, actually, if these cards, again, do anything or even can change anything on a card, you can still target those cards with them. So we're also going to be running Magic. Magical Hack, Sleight of Mind, and Trait Doctoring, each of which all are, you know, somewhat similar, essentially. Magical Hack replaces names of basic lands, Sleight of Mind changes color, Trait Doctoring also changes color or basic lands, again, does not matter. Again, it really doesn't matter if they do actually anything, because what they really are doing, again, is just being a great clone spell for a single mana that can clone anything. And on top of that, Trait Doctoring has Cypher, which is a kind of a weird mechanic, but, you know, one that can be very effective. Basically, you can exile it and code it onto a creature you control. Whenever that creature goes combination to a player, you can cast a copy of the encoded card without paying its mana cost. So this is a spell you can get even more use out of. 
Moving on, how about Enervate, which is going to cost one more mana, but it's still going to be very good in this deck. Tap target artifact, creature, or land, draw a card at the beginning of the next turn. So this can tap, you know, basically, again, the kinds of permits that we want to be able to tap, and it's going to be a great delayed draw effect. Next up, Psychopop Tree says tap or untap target permanent, and Toils of Night and Day says tap or untap target permanent, then tap or untap another target permanent. So this one can get us one mana, or even more in certain situations, and again, I'll talk about some of those lands here in a bit. But yeah, it can be a great effective way to target what we need to target, to copy, and also to untap a land. Which then brings us to the Golden Pig of this deck, which is of course the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig of this deck is Hidden Strings. It's a sorcery that says you may tap or untap target permanent, then you may tap or untap another target permanent. So again, we can target what we want to target, we can untap again, most likely a land, and yeah, that can give us a lot of value in many situations, or at the very least, this basically just costs one less mana for us, and of course, on top of that, it has Cypher. Which, like I mentioned with Trait Doctoring, essentially is a great way for us to be able to recast this throughout the game. So this is a card that can provide us a ton of value, can help out in a lot of different situations, and in my opinion, is definitely worthy of the title of the Golden Pig of this deck. But of course, we are nowhere near done with talking about targeting spells just yet. So we're also going to be running some cantrip targeting spells like Thermal Flux, Thrilling Wisps, and Twisted Image. Thermal Flux is going to make target non-snow permanent become snow until that turn, or the exact opposite, which, you know, again, really doesn't matter. We don't care what that does. What we do care about is that this is an instant for just a blue mana that can target anything, and it's going to draw us a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So a delayed draw target spell, yeah, that can be great in this kind of attack. Next up, there's Cerulean Wisp, which can have us untap a creature and draw a card. In Twisted Image, which can switch target creatures' power and toughness to live turn and help us draw a card. Again, can these help us out in certain scenarios? Absolutely! But what we really care about is, yeah, just one mana, target something, draw a card. So we're also going to be running Fleet and Distraction, Chilling Trap, and Stream of Unconsciousness. Fleet and Distraction is going to give target creature minus one, minus zero until end of turn and draw, say, a card. And then Chilling Trap and Stream of Consciousness are going to do the exact same thing, but it's going to be minus four, minus zero. And keep in mind, this is where our commander's changeling comes in handy, because each of those has essentially as a clause, you know, if you control a wizard draw a card, and our commander is a changeling, so yeah, every single creature type, including wizard. Regardless, next up, we've got some ways to up our creatures out in combat, potentially. Slip through space, cloak of feathers, and leap. Slip through space says target creature can be blocked this turn, draw a card, and then cloak of feathers and leap are each going to give target creature flying until end of turn, and they're going to draw us a card. Again, the main thing that matters, though, again, is that these are clone spells, essentially, for a single mana that also draw us cards. But of course, we've got plenty of other great ways to draw cards in this deck, and one of the best ones out there has got to be Waybreak Hippocamp. It says whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, draw a card. We have a lot of very cheap and effective instants in this deck, so if we can very easily draw three cards with this with each strip around the table, doing something that we already want to do. Next up, how about Verity Circle, which is incredible with many cards in this deck. It says whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped, if it isn't being declared an attacker, you may draw a card. And we can also pay four in a blue to tap to our creature without flying, but yeah, with this... And again, with those spells that can tap creatures, well, if we need to draw cards, let's tap down some creatures. I mean, just think about Giga drowsing your opponent's creatures and having this on the field. Next up, though, Commander's Awakening can help us provide some consistent value, though. It has a send, and at the beginning of your upkeep, each player draws a card, but if you get the City's Blessing, instead only you draw a card. So, yeah, City's Blessing, very easy to get, especially in a deck like this. And, of course, we can also double up our draws with stuff like Thought Reflection, which just, yeah, doubles up our draws, so we can draw a ton of cards. I mean, just think about those cantrips Copy a creature for one mana, draw two cards. Yeah, sign me up for that. Next up though, how about Change of Plans? A great card in this deck. Each of XR creatures you control connive, then you may have any number of them phase out. So conniving has us draw cards and discard cards, and if we discard non-link cards, we get counters on that creature. And yeah, phasing out can also be a great way to save creatures, so this card can do a lot for us. Again, of course, on top of being able to target creatures to help clone. Speaking of which, Open Into Wonder says XR creatures can't be blocked this turn. Until end of turn, those creatures gain whether this creature deals comedy into a player, draw a card. A great way to get our creatures through, clone one of them, and draw a lot of cards. Speaking of drawing cards, there's Treasure Cruise, which is just a great draw spell. Delve, so we can basically just cast this for a single blue mana at a certain point, draw three cards. So of course, there are plenty of great ways for us to dig down into our deck. <music> 
Next up, we also have some ways to throw a wrench into our opponent's plans by, well, protecting our things with things like you see a guard approach, dive down, and Mizium skin. You see a guard approach is actually very flexible. It says choose one to strike the guard, tap target creature, or hide to target creature control gains hexproof until end of turn. So if we need to protect ourselves, well, we can tap down an opponent's creature, and if not, we can utilize it to protect one of our things, and again, it's just basically a one mana clone spell in a lot of situations for us. Speaking of which, there's dive down, which says target creature control gets plus zero, plus three, and gains hexproof until end of turn. So yeah, this can help us out in a lot of situations. And then Mizium skin can help us out in multiple ways. Target creature control gets plus zero, plus one, and gains hexproof until end of turn, and we can also overload it. So if we want to protect one thing or clone one thing, well, we can just utilize this as a one-off spell, but if we overload it, we can protect our entire team. Moving on, we're also going to be running Reality Ripple, which says target artifact creature or land phases out. This can be a very effective card in a lot of situations. We can utilize this against an opponent, or again, utilize it to copy something, or yeah, utilize it to protect one of our things. But of course, we're not done with throwing wrenches in our opponent's plans just yet. Because we're also going to be running plenty of great low to the ground removal spells as well that can also be used to clone our things that we're stealing with cards like Alchemist Retrieval, Void Snare, and Geist Wave. Alchemist Retrieval says return target non land permanent you control to its owner's hand, but we can also cleave that you control text off so we can either target one of our things for just one mana or an opponent's thing for two. Or how about Void Snare, which is at sorcery speed, but it can return any target non land permanent to its owner's hand for just a single mana. So again, just think about, you know, stealing an opponent's creature temporarily and making a copy of it with this. And bouncing their thing back to their hand. And then how about Geist Wave? Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. If you control that permanent, draw a card. Next up, there's the part of the realm which can bounce any non-land permanent back to its owner's hand, and we can even foretell it for just a blue mana. And then Expel from Raska has a send. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. If you have the city's blessing, you may put that permanent on top of its owner's library instead. Or how about Boomerang, which says return target permanent to its owner's hand. Note that it does not specify non-land, so we can even bounce lands with this. Next up, there's Banishing Knack and Retraction Helix, which do the exact same thing. Until end of turn, target creature gains, tap, return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. These can be especially effective with some of our untapped spells. Next up, though, how about Fumble, which says return target creature to its owner's hand, gain control of all auras and equipment that were attached to it, then attach them to another target creature. This can be devastating against an opponent's creature, and yeah, help us steal even more things. But now that we've talked about every single non-land card in this deck, let's talk about the lands. First up, how about Glimmer Post, which says, when it enters the battlefield, you gain one life for each Locust on the battlefield, and it can tap Ray Colas. So this can gain us a ton of life if we really need to, because again, we've got ways to target any permanent, including lands, so yeah, we can make a ton of copies of this to gain an absurd amount of life. Or we can make even more Locusts with Cloud Post, which comes into play tap, but it's going to tap Ray Colas for each Locust in play. So yeah, that can get out of control in no time. Moving on, there's Riptide Laboratory, which can tap for a color, so we can pay one in a blue and tap to return target wizard we control back to its owner's hand. So yeah, this can actually help protect our commander. And of course, finally, we're also going to be rounding out this deck with a ton of basic islands. Now, like I mentioned at the start of this episode, this deck is very budget friendly. Even though our commander is three or four dollars or so, the total deck price is just $32.67. And actually, you can save even more if you've already got the basic lands for this deck, which are counted at 10 cents a piece. So yeah, there's potential for extra savings there. And speaking of potential savings, you might be able to save even more by buying this deck on TCG Player and utilizing heavily played and damaged cards, which of course need a home too. Though, do keep in mind this estimate cost does not include the cost of shipping, which might vary depending upon where you live. And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again, and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all of their support.